Hello, and welcome to another episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. Happy to be here with you and happy to have you here with us. If you're joining us on the video, welcome aboard. Glad to have you with us. If you're listening to the audio podcast, glad to have you back with us in this segment. You heard the intro before. And our guest today is Captain Mike Daly. Uh, he is a 35-year fire service veteran serving in a department in Monroe Township, New Jersey. The captain serves as a staff instructor in two county fire academies, is an adjunct professor at two county colleges, developing and delivering FESHE approved curriculum in fire behavior and building construction. Uh, he is a 20 year member of the New Jersey Task Force One, USAR, serving as a rescue squad officer, and is a FEMA lead instructor in the Structural Collapse Specialist Program. Captain has a bachelor's degree in public safety and holds certifications as a fire officer, fire instructor, fire official, FEMA all hazards operations section chief, on scene incident commander, fire investigation technician, certified fire and explosions investigator, and has completed the knowledge fire dynamics program from the International Association of Arson Investigators. He has earned international accreditation as a chief training officer and a fire officer from the Center for Public Service Excellence. He is a member of the Institution of Fire Engineers and serves as a contributing technical editor for Firehouse Magazine and Firehouse.com. He is currently serving as president of Project Kill the Flashover, a training and research organization that provides training and advanced fire behavior to students from all over the world. He can be reached, and we'll repeat this at the end, at the email F is in Foxtrot, S is in Sierra, P is in Papa, C Charlie Educators at gmail.com. Captain, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to Five Alarm Task Force. Well, I always appreciate the invitation, Stephen. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me again. Our pleasure. And we have two good, really good topics we're going to be discussing today in our two segments. Segment one, we're going to be talking about the new NFPA uh, standard for 1700. And then in our second segment, we're going to get back to the concept of kill the flashover and how important it is. So, Cap, let's get into 1700. We know that there's been a lot of discussion about it. We've seen it on uh, social media uh, by lots of people. Hopefully, most of them were actual firefighters and not the ones who sit in the basement at the age of 36, just waiting for mom to cook dinner and typing to make believe I'm a fireman. So <laughs> let's let's address it for those who are the professionals, whether they be volunteer, career, or UI, we all need to know what this is going to be about. I would agree. Uh, I took a look at the document when it first came out. It came out about, about four years ago. It's actually starting to hit uh, the renewal, and uh, NFPA is actually combining that document with 1710 and 1720. And you're going to start to see these mega documents that are coming out in a lot of different categories. And 1700 is in absent of that as well. So it's going to be mixed in with, uh, with a couple other documents as well. It's, um, it's a very thorough document. It's um, only about 34 pages, but it is really, really well put together. Uh, it's got a lot of information in it based on a lot of the science that the UL and Fire Service Research Institute has been doing over the last few years. It brings the science in with the fire dynamics, discusses it, brings construction into the mix as well, and then puts it together in a later part of the document with the changes in strategic decision-making and some of the tactics that have to be implemented based on a lot of what we see on arrival and the response that we have coming to that first alarm. Now, it, it, it doesn't really matter if your career volunteer, wild and urban in phrase. It really doesn't matter. The document doesn't predicate one over the other. The document says, here's what this is, here's what the science is telling us, and here's where the fire service needs to be to address it. And if you don't have this many people, then this is how you address it. And if you're dealing with a building like this, this is how you would address it. And if you're uh, thinking about changing these and moving these tactics to this, which is 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 going to take some time for the fire service to do that, any any organization, here's how you implement it. You know, one of the things that a lot of people have always complained about the, the NFPA standards is they come up with some great information. You have to agree. There's, there's a lot of great stuff. Absolutely. 
and, 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 you know, and I'm an advocate of it as well. I sit on the, uh, <clears throat> the actual uh, committee that does fire control within a structure using fire dynamics as well with, with brother Andy Starnes. And the, the reality of it is many of the times we see standards and, and, and a lot of people have always told me, well, you know, NFPA standards are great, but the problem is they never come up with an implementation plan on how we would implement these things. How do we do that? How do we, it's great to have these rules. It's great to have all this, this information it really is. What do we do with it? Well, one of the great things I think about what 1700 did was said, here's the information. Here's how you need to make the change. And here's how we suggest you implement it. So the last two chapters are really focused on implementation, how you bring all the players together, how you bring uh, the, the resources that you would need, where you can find these resources to actually start to look at putting these changes into place and how you'd be able to pull that off. So to me, it's a very thorough document, although it's not very big, but it's very thorough and it references a lot of the other documents that NFPA already puts out. It references 1710 for career departments and it references 1720 for volunteer departments. And it, it doesn't discriminate from one or the other. It says, okay, if you're still dealing with a garden apartment fire, a three-story garden apartment fire, and you have a fire on the first floor communicating to the other two floors, here's how you have to handle that whether you're a career or volunteer, and now it's really up to you how you decide to get those resources and that material into place, into operation, and how to do that. So it still provides direction on what you need to do, but there has to, there has to be some flexibility because every department responds differently. How I respond wouldn't be any, would be different than how you would respond. You know, a metropolitan department is going to respond much different than a smaller career department than we will. Volunteer departments all over the country are going to respond differently than how some of the career departments would respond and some of the volunteer departments all over the country are going to respond different to how some of the other volunteer departments all over the country respond. So there's got to be that, that point where there's enough flexibility so that every department has a way to make this happen. And I think the document's thorough enough to do that. I really do. That, that's really good to hear because I, I know that over the years, even since I've been out and just affiliated from the outside back in, I've heard the same kind of comments that the NFPA does come up with some really good stuff but they never tell us how to do it in in our department. Now, of course, they're not they can't you know compartmentalize for every individual department. But the fact that, as you've just shared, that this revision of seventeen hundred, picking up seventeen ten and seventeen twenty, does have a really strong implementation uh, program for both the career and the volunteer departments, and I think that may give it. Uh, a little more uh, liking by the people, more acceptance to say, wait a second. Well, they're really telling us what we can do based on uh, the number of personnel we have responding on, uh, the number of pieces of apparatus that are responding. Wow, we can work with this. Now we just have to figure out a way to get into that that gel and make it work work for us. And I think that's great news to hear especially in these changing in, in troubling times in some ways for the fire service with our problem with you know retention and, and recruitment. So I, I'm glad to hear that. And by the way, that reminds me in uh, today's email. Now we're recording this on Wednesday, uh, May 3rd. I received this morning or might've been from last night, but uh, the new NIST uh, in, informational uh, sheet on PFAS and the uh, investigation they've recently done. It's really interesting. Those of us who've been in this PFAS fight um, might really benefit from what I read just in the in the blurb today, but I found it very interesting. And I found it uh, comforting because it's kind of helping us reduce that fear factor that we've had since we've discovered that PFAS has been on our gear since 77. And there are going to be ways, some of them relatively easy, to make that change. So if you haven't had a chance, folks, look it up. It's the NIST. It just came out either late yesterday afternoon or early this morning and grab that. So let's then get back now, with that being said, to the NFPA and some of the high points that you really uh, feel need to address with with uh, our, our listeners and our viewers um, on some of the key issues and the implementation thoughts. So let's talk about what you just brought up, Steve, because I think it segues very good into one of the chapters. There's actually okay. a chapter in 1700 
on hygiene. Okay. And exposure. It, it, there's a huge part of that document that covers hygiene and exposure. And we're talking about the things that we should be doing and then the okay. things that we could be doing better. And I'll, for example, should be doing. How many times, and I think we've all seen this, you can take uh, the cover of any magazine or you can look through any fire trade magazine or document or newsletter that you get. And we always see, excuse me, we always see somebody doing something that's probably not the smartest thing to do. I hate to say it, but if we're going to talk honestly, right. we have to talk honestly. And I've never talked bad about any other department before I talk about myself, my other department. But the reality of it is we've all seen it, whether you're watching a university of YouTube or whether you're, you, you, you subscribe to a trade journal or you get a newsletter sent to your fire station. And the reality of it is <clears throat> the things that we do really drives through tradition. So for example, uh, I wear a leather helmet. It is tradition. You want to talk about traditions? We can argue leather helmets. We can argue fog nozzles versus smooth bores. <laughs> but I wear a leather helmet because when I look at the study, on, on, on impact and protection right. to your head, it's probably one of the best helmets to wear. And, and granted, there's some traditional look to it as well. But when we look at turnout gear and what we respond in and what we wear and how often we clean it and the things we'd be exposed to and when we go on air and when we shouldn't be on air, you know, it's all really laid out in this uh, for us through 1700. And, and I'm just going to give kudos to, you know, Chief Starnes and Chief Oak and, and Chief Coy and Chief Willie who started KTF. We used to decon in the street after every test burn. And we actually worked with the Firefighter Cancer Network and sent that material out and had the water from the decon. We used to decon with just water and decon with soap and see the difference. We would knock almost 88% of the, of the contaminants off the turnout gear in the first rinse. So if we're not even doing that on the scene, I did that on the scene one time about five years ago on a mutual aid alarm. I had a new firefighter that got hired. And we're four months into it. We caught a mutual aid assignment into a neighboring town. We come out, and I asked for the bumper line just to wash my, my guys off. And I was first. They washed me off first. Would you believe it? By the time I got back to my firehouse, my chief had gotten a phone call from somebody who was at the scene that said I was hazing my guys. Believe it or not. I was rinsing the contaminants off from their serenity or hazing. Those are the things we could be doing. <clears throat> the simple, rotate your people in and out, limiting the exposure. How do we do that? Well, we need personnel to do it. How do we do it? For, even on the instructor side, it covers training. What you do with your gear and training it covers what instructors should be doing while they're doing live fire training, how many they should be doing, how to decon your gear immediately. You know, it, it's, it's all there just for that alone. Now, even we've changed some of our responses that we don't go full gear anymore. We bring our gear with us, right? but, but now we're limiting the amount of time we're going to spend in the gear. And that's going to be a, a department policy that's specific to every department. But that's just one example. One of the things that I really like about the document is it brings the science to what the UL and the FSRI is doing and says, here's why we need to make these changes. And we got to stop overall fighting today's fires like we fought them 40 years ago right with, with different fuels we're dealing with higher heat release rate fuels when, when i got into fire service 35 years ago we were fighting fires in relatively stable buildings with legacy fuels that put out about 8500 btus per cubic foot of fuel we're now dealing with lightweight construction and different types of construction techniques with high heat release free fuels that are putting out 18,000 BTUs per cubic foot. We're putting them in houses that are well over 3,000 square feet, where we had them in houses that were less than 1,000 to 1,200 square feet. We've insulated these houses better. There's more air available in these larger houses now. We can see dynamic events within the compartments themselves before a, a, a a, a pane of glass is even broken or a door is even forced. So the science is there. It's proving it. Um, and it discusses what the exposure is, what you can expect to see based on these fuels. It, it's, it's full of the information from the tests that they're, that they're doing. A lot of the information is available on the FSRI website with free training for departments. I mean, I'm putting my, my whole department through it. 
There's uh, 24 classes. I'm doing one every other month um, just to introduce them to the science, bring them up to speed, because it's going to take a few years to get the change to move. So here's the training. Here's the document. Here's the proof. So the science is there. <clears throat> the fire dynamics itself are actually explained in there as well, what they expect, what they anticipate. Pretty accurate as well. And then it goes into construction. Now, I, I teach construction at the college level, and unfortunately, they have to listen to me talk about construction for 15 weeks. But, <laughs> um, yeah, and one, uh, one night is a specific type of construction, whereas the document brings the construction to the reader, but it doesn't spend the time on explaining it. it what it does, and I think it does a very good job at this, every different type of construction has a specific problem for us. For example, type one construction is the biggest issues that we have with those. Um, vertical shafts for egress, um, usually drop ceilings due to the, the, the mass steel and concrete, occupant indifference from people chalking doors open where they shouldn't be, uh, be left open, where type twos, unfortunately, with their type of cold drawn steel roofs and lightweight steel, truss, uh, steel bar joists collapse very quickly. Type fives, full combustion, uh, of the gravity resistance system, type threes with void spaces due to the introduction of wood into masonry materials. Every one of them has their own specific nuances that we have to deal with. And the nice thing about this document is it, it, it covers each one and says, here's where your problems lie. Here's what you can expect when you have a high energy event in a compartment, and this is what you should anticipate based on that construction. So it, it doesn't get into the whole uh, loads and forces and stresses versus strain, but it does say you're going to have these buildings and here's what we have proven that happens in these types of buildings and how to deal with it. So You, know, you mentioned uh, the looking back at the legacy time, which was my time and in, in starting in 77. And I, I think one of the biggest changes, and you mentioned about the change in type of fuels because my day we had real wood furniture it, the cushions were filled with K-Pak, not with a butyl foam, you know, benzene-laced foam. But the incipient stage, I remember my first class, fire, state college, state fire college class, tossed the incipient stage then was four to eight minutes. Today, we're looking at two to maybe five minutes for an incipient stage to move and ignite. So if we're not there and we're not ready with water, you know, we've 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 all talked about fast water, but not everybody believes in it like a lot of us do. But yet, you no, can you're see, right. You can see the videos, some really good videos that get posted where fast water, whether they use the deck gun itself right off right off the bat, or they got a two and a half out right away. They they went in with two in, inch three quarters. The fact is, fast water makes the difference, and especially with an incipient stage so drastically reduced if you if we want to stand a chance of knocking this down before it gets away from us we have to be there be ready and do what has to be done right away i would agree and and i didn't come into the fire service much later than you did so we fought some of the same yeah. type fire and one of the things about that and i think you bring up a good point <clears throat> is time Legacy fuels do take longer to get to a free burning or a flash over state compared to what we're seeing as high heat release fuels today. Problem with what we found back was we would get to a fire while it was still in the growth, getting into that free burning stage. Today's responders are getting to an incident well after the compartment has either flashed or has spread to another compartment or has breached the compartment and somebody from the outside has seen it. So it's already gotten to the point where it's being reported from a passerby. Well, we're well off into the races now with the newer yeah. fuels and the newer construction. So yeah, time is everything. And, and how you bring that to uh, the scene, what, in, what your response package is to the scene. And, and that's going to vary uh, now, unfortunately, even on residential dwellings. Now, well, you know, we kind of segued a little bit into it, and and this is a good part, I think, to, to bring up now the changes in the strategy. We talked about the changes in the fuel. Uh, one of the things when it comes to strategic considerations, 
it's all about, it's always been about science, whether you, you, you agree with it, you don't, fine. But, and I'm going to tell you, fast water is good water. If, you know, the fire doesn't, I've, I said this all the time, the fire doesn't care about where the water comes from. And I can tell you, it's been my experiences when it comes to victims, Mrs. Smith might be laying on the floor in her nylon nighty where it's 300 degrees and she's not on the floor praying, boy, I hope they go offensive. She has no care whatsoever about how that water gets into that room. All she cares about is that it gets in there relatively quick. So the changes now address that. And the reality is we have to change strategy because the science, the fuel, the air, the, uh, the energy that's being put off and the, and, and the compartment. Now, everybody talks about the science. And I think one of the, one of the great things about this document is that it focuses on compartmentation as well. It's one of the things that, that we talk about at KTF. One of the questions that we ask in the first semester, we get a bunch of uh, seasoned firefighters together. And the first question we come out with is fire behavior change. And we get yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, really? Okay, tell me how. Well, we get more energy. Well, that doesn't change fire behavior. It just changes the amount of output of the process. The output changes, but the fire behavior hasn't changed. Well, uh, we have more fuel. All right, so quantity doesn't change the science. The science is still there. It just has more fuel. And more fuel can be good and it could be bad. I mean, depending. Well, um, we, we have uh, we have more windows to break, so we can ventilate it better. Well, it doesn't again. It doesn't change the process. What a lot of people miss, and, and, and this is this is really key for the science. Is and, and I'm going to quote Alan Bernasini because I had um, a great opportunity in my career. I tell people this all the time. One of the greatest moments of my career that I always will go back on is I got to have dinner with Alan Bernasini and Tom Brennan at the same time. Now let me let me let me preempt that comment by saying I was in a room with 30 other people. So I just happened to be sitting across from where Alan Brunacini was. And it was probably about 18 years ago. We were in Reno. I was brought out there to do some firefighter survival training with a good friend of mine. We were all sitting there talking. We were eating. And one of the great things about Brunacini, I always thought, was he very rarely talked, but when he but he listened to everybody. He didn't, didn't care where you were from. He didn't care about your experience. He always felt that everybody had a respected position on where they think the fire service should be. So I, and here I am, uh, you know. Jersey guy sitting across from one of the legends. And I, I didn't say a word. All I did was kept my ears open. And we got to talking about fire behavior and uh, strategy. And, and he had said something that I thought was brilliant. To this day, I still quote it. He said, nothing ruins a good fire like putting a building around it. And I said, wow. I mean, you know what? And, and he really kind of brought that to light to say, this isn't about the construction. It's not about the, the science. It's about the science when it hits the compartment. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people miss. It's the compartment. It's the compartment. How does the compartment react? How does the compartment influence the behavior that's actually going to happen? Because when it's outside the compartment and there's no roof and there's no walls, all the energy goes up and away. We don't care. Well, the minute that we put four walls and a ceiling around it, well, now that's changed because now the, the energy that's reinvested into the fuels allows for faster spread. Uh, rapid uh, fire growth and propagation to other compartments, faster energy transfer to the comp to the building itself, the gravity resistance system of the building itself. And now what a lot of people miss is it's not about the science. It's about the compartment. And that's one of the things that we really start to talk about when we start doing more fire behavior training, especially with, with killed flash over. So, and that's why the strategy is important. One of the big changes, there's two big changes, I think in the strategy, uh, part of this document. And, and one of them has everything to do with who you're bringing to the game. 1710, 1720, doesn't matter. Here's the thing. NFPA says the first arriving assignment to that structure fire, and this is based on 2,000 square foot house in the middle of nowhere, no exposures, no basement. Doesn't matter if you're career, volunteer, part paid, paid on call. If you're wearing turnout gear and you're responding on an initial alarm, your job is to get two lines in service flowing 300 gallons a minute. Period. Doesn't, doesn't say only the paid guys have to do that or only the volunteer contingency has to do that. Or doesn't say that. It says, here's what you need to do. And you need to coordinate it with ventilation now. And if you can't do that, 
at the same time, and this is very clear in the strategic considerations of this chapter, if you cannot coordinate that and do those simultaneously, you will now do it sequentially, which means your focus is now on suppression. And you led into a great point about transitional attack here. And I am a firm believer in it. And I've practiced it. I have video to prove it. And we use it when necessary. We are, and for the life of me, I get these departments that, that talk to me about suppression. We do strategy and tactics talks. I was actually, uh, one of the academies I, I teach at, I teach a modern engine company tactics, and we talk all about strategic decision-making and fire and application of water. We show them the difference when we get out onto the burn pit. I get this all the time. Well, what about pushing fire? I got bad news for you. This is, uh, everybody says this is a Mike Daly original because uh, everybody uses it. You can't push fire, you put out. If you put the water in the right spot, like you're trained, the right angle, in the right flow, with the right amount of GPM to absorb that energy, the fire goes out, period. You know, and I get departments that tell me, well, you know, we're traditionally an offensive department. What does that even mean? We all are, unless the situation dictates that we can't. Right? And, and the difference here is being able to take that strategic consideration on that compartment based on what that building's in and how you're going to apply that. So transitionally, yeah. Offensively, sure. Defensively, yeah. Can I change my mind halfway through? Absolutely. Uh, the fire behind me that you're looking at was a fire in a, in a mutual aid town. Started out defensively, went transitional, and pushed in offensively. So we did all three. You know, does it happen? Sure. Why not? Because the situation dictated it. First engine in. We were the first engine in. It wasn't my shift. I'm going by what I was told. First engine in, large house to the left, as you can see, fire in a garage. Four firefighters showing up. What are we doing? You know as well as I do, we're not putting a line through the front door. But what we want to do is we want to protect the residents. So we protect the residents. Firefighters did an excellent job keeping the fire in the garage. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the garage was a loss. Um, but based on the considerations that were made, very good decisions. Um, and it works. And, this, and it, it works. So. You know, um, Kevin, uh Former Deputy Chief Kevin Burns from Framingham, Mass., which is my hometown, oh. now a city. A, a great guy. I, I, there's only a couple of years that separate us. We went to the same schools. We were there at the same time. We didn't know each other as kids. Uh, but the fact is that he's been great on social media, and he's been he's done a couple of podcasts with us. And I, I asked him when a couple of years ago when there was all that kind of very um, – caustic debate about uh, aggressive and transitional and defensive. So I asked them, I said, Chief, you know, I know the buildings in our community from when I grew up there. If you had a, if you had a working fire, what would, which attack would you use? I mean, do you think it all have to be aggressive? He goes, Steve, I have three words. It all depends. He goes, I can go down to 12 Main Street on a working fire. Everybody's out of the house. All the pets are out. Everything is safe. And I can know what kind of attack I can do on that on that house from my size up. And then I give my primary assignment to the first new apparatus. He says, but two nights later, I could be at 14 Main Street. And they're, not everybody's out of the house. We don't know where they are. We have, I have to hold. That's totally different. He says, so I, I can't say to anybody, to you, or he goes, he said, to, or anybody else, that one is the one to use, one method is the one to use with every call. You can't do that. And that's where your good first incident commander, or if it's the officer in the first arriving apparatus, has to know how to make those decisions for what's best for life and property. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Chief Burns actually spent a week with us um, probably five years ago down in uh, North Carolina with KTF. A wealth of information, true consummate professional, still keep in touch with him. And, and we have the same mindset. I'll actually cut his uh, his opinion down a word instead of three. I use two all the time. Would you go offensive or defensive or transitional? Definitely, maybe. <laughs> and, and, it's, 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 and I, I think Chief Burns says it the best. Depends when I show up. What do I see? What do I see? What do I have behind me? And, 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 and again, Nobody's saying you have to do anything in any specific way. And some departments are like, well, our, our policy is to push through the front door all the time. Why? 
you know, it, it just, to me, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, it, it all depends. It really does depend. I mean, if I have the same volume of fire coming out of a single family residential dwelling, that's, that's 1800 square feet. And I have the same volume of fire coming out of the middle store of a strip mall. That's a type two construction, single floor, single story, flat roof. My entire thought process is going to change. And my, my tactics are going to change based on the compartment again and, and what the, the actions around it are. And, you know, I guess we all would love to be able to say, and I'm sure you would agree, we'd love to be able to say, well, when you show up and this is happening, you do step A, B, and C. It'd be great if it always worked that way. It doesn't. Nothing we do works that way. And it's not just in the world of fire suppression. We've my department performs technical rescue as well. Perform technical rescue with you, sir. I've been a rescue guy for, since, for the last 28 years or 30 years of my life, in local fire departments and on a FEMA task force. No matter what you do, you show up to an extrication. What do you cut first? It depends. I show up to a rope rescue. Where's our anchor? It depends. I show up to a confined space job. How we make an access? It depends. It always depends. We'd love to be able to say there's always a, a step one, step two, step three, but we there's no document in the world that's going to give us that. We can't right. even do that in our own policies. I can't even do that in my own policy unless I'm doing something specific in the department. You know, the flag always goes up at 7 a.m. The flag comes down at dusk. That's about <laughs> as definitive as we can get. But when it comes to operational decisions on the fire ground, it just doesn't happen. Now, strategically, we have to start changing again because the compartment's changing. So one of the changes that I think is big in this document is when it talks about, and it talks about different applications. It talks about residential structures. And it, it talks about apartment buildings and uh, single and two family, multiple dwellings. It talks about garden. It talks about townhomes. There's a, there's a part of this on all of it. So here's where your thought process should be. The one thing that I think is very important for a lot of people to understand and this document makes the difference between an estate home and a residential dwelling. Estate home is anything greater than 3,000 square feet. Now, that's going to be a problem for a lot of people because there's a lot of people that have houses that are well over 3,000 square feet. I can tell you a street that's a half a mile from my firehouse has seven houses on it. And it's a courtyard. The average size house on that street is 12,270 square feet. That's, you heard me, 12,270 square feet. I will not fight that fire exactly the same. I don't care if it's a bedroom fire in that house versus a bedroom fire in an 1,800 square foot house. You are not doing the same tactics. It's just not happening. And it, and it has to be based on the compartment. And the nice thing about this is, well, what if you have a strip mall? Here's how you should address that. What if you have a uh, medical office? Well, that's how you address that. What if it's a theater? Here's how you address that, places of assembly. The document's pretty thorough there, and it covers that. Now, it doesn't write your policy for you because it doesn't right. know what you're bringing to, to the party. It's just not what it is, but here's where your thought process should be. And if you can't do these things simultaneously, then you have to figure out how you can do them sequentially. And sequentially, the first thing that has to be done is suppression. Tom Brennan said it the best, and Andy Fredericks, I believe, said it as well. Once the fire goes out, all your other problems seem to be secondary. Everything else seems to get better. It's true. Sure. That's a great point. That really, it really is. And hopefully we're going to be seeing in some of the people who have been studying KTF and really do pay attention to the concept of, of tactics and don't just rely on that's the way we've always done it. And we'll have more and more of them as the younger group starts coming into their time, uh, into their prime, maybe after 10 years in and stuff like that, replacing our senior people today who are getting ready to retire out over the next five, five to 10 years as well. We can't, it's difficult enough as it is right now with reten retention and recruitment. But it's a great point to understand that that is a strong reason why we can't just go with opinion and history. We have to be able to look at what is burning, what is happening at this moment on that call, focus on that, and do the best you can at that point in time. And whatever it requires, 
you to do. Maybe part of it comes from your legacy uh, uh, operations that you've learned, you know, 10 years ago. But some of them are going to be not those, some of those will not be applicable to today because of changes that's happened in, in those 10 years. So I think that there is no doubt that we can hope for as this document is, is uh, shared and read and understood, because a lot of people read, not necessarily understanding and buying into it, but those who do read this and learn from it can bring a higher professional, I'm trying to think, professional exercise to, to the dance. That's, that's what it's about. Because you, know, you, bring up, you bring up a lot of really strong points, and, and, and you are 100% on the mark, Steve, because there are points that have to be addressed with this. Uh, Brother John Dixon, who I, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, John and I do a lot of training together, we do a lot of fire behavior training together. One of the things that, that he, he always preaches is you can have your own opinions, but you just can't have your own facts. It just doesn't happen. Um, and if we talk about change, which is kind of what we're leading to, and you're, and, and you're right on, the fire service members hate two things. One, change. Two, the way things are. Right. <laughs> so you can come up with a solution. Oh, why do we have to do that? Well, you don't like that. Well, yeah, but I don't like this either. Okay. So problem is the implementation, and, and you're right. How do you get people to change? Because we can take this information to that recruit whose mind is raw, it's impressionable. It, you know, uh, Chief Avila in his book talks about unconscious incompetence. You didn't even know what you don't know. And then you found out you didn't know. So then you become consciously incompetent. Um, I can take all of this information over the course of hundreds of hours of, of recruit training and, and drive this point home to those new members of the fire service. And then they go back to the ones who have not done anything since they've either been appointed, promoted, deputized, whatever we're calling it. And then, unfortunately, we hear those six devastating words to the recruit. That's not what we do here. And all that information that we give them starts to leak out of their brain because they start to develop the muscle memory that the department wants them to do. So for us, we I believe, and this is, this is where I think the document covers this as well. How do we implement it? Well, here's the thing. We have to get everybody to the table. And this isn't just the firefighter, the officer, the chief. This is automatic mutual aid departments. This is fire academies. This is everybody. And I, and I posed this question at this chief conference uh, that I talked at two weeks ago. I said, all of you that, that got promoted – in the last 10 years, raise your hand. And probably the better part of 75% of the attendees raised their hand. And I said, okay, if you've read a fire service tactic books in the last three years, raise your hand. And probably an eighth of them raised their hand. And the reality of it is things change. Fire service is a dynamic, changing occupation. Career volunteer, it's an occupation. Call it with a profession. Right. Whether you get paid or not, if you put the gear on, that's, that's, you're a firefighter, period. And, and I can tell you that my department is going through a captain's test right now. That the test is going to run in December. I'm reading the books. And everybody's like, why are you reading the books? You've been an officer for, yeah, I know I've been an officer a long time. But again, if you're teaching these candidates this, we all need to know it because somebody thought it was important enough to put it on a promotional exam. Let's read it. Let's see what, what it says. Now, I'll, I'll hold my own opinions about the books, but – I'm still reading them because I want to know what they're being taught. I want to know what they're studying, what's going to require them. And ha because you know what, that's kind of how they're going to operate. They're going to, they're going to, you know, and promotional processes, unfortunately, sometimes it's nothing more than regurgitation of facts as it needs to be. But at some point that application has to make it out into the street. So we, we have to get them all together. And that includes the instructors. And if you think a firefighter's opinion is hard to change, try to change an instructor's opinion. When we've been teaching at an academy for five years, 10 years, 20 years. In some cases, I'm at my academy 32 years. I read the new textbook every time it comes out. Why? Because the curriculum changes. Now the, the, the UL, 
Fire Service Research Institute is putting this science saying, here it is, here's what it does, here's the proof. You want the numbers? Here's the numbers. We put it in a nice package. We put it on a, on a platter. We put a bow around it. We wrapped it in paper. Here it is. And I will throw this question out. I threw this question out two weeks ago of all my instructor brethren that are either listening to this podcast or, or teaching at an academy. When was the last time you looked at your curriculum and said, man, this is not where we need to be today? And a lot of it is like that. There are not many let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. To find an, an educational institute for fire service education that is proactive is becoming rarer as we go. Uh, now, I do a lot of my own private training. I don't use programs that are purchased. I write my own stuff, and I write my own stuff based on research. Unfortunately, there's a lot of training that is out there that is saturating the service that is making it very difficult to separate the really, really spot on stuff to the stuff that's not. And the messages that are being put out, in some cases are very good, and in some cases are questionable at best. So we really need to put everybody together and say, okay, here's the end result. Here's where we need to be. The department needs to do this. Let's put everybody together. Whether you're a career volunteer, I don't care. Let's put everybody together that you play with in the sandbox on a first alarm assignment. All right, here's where we should be. Here's what we need to do. Here's our automatic aid companies. Here's what you should expect. Here's our training officers in our apartments. I, I'm the training officer in my department. I'm putting everybody through the FSRI program. Why would I rewrite what's already there? The stuff is accurate. The science is there. It's free. It's right. My chief has no complaints. There's no cost to it. You, you have a captive audience. You're sitting in the firehouse. One a month, you do. One every other month, you do. Let's start moving the, the, the policies in this direction. And then let's go out and practice it at the fire academies to show how it works. And what, we would, what would we do based on the application, based on what's coming to the scene? Let's do transitional attack. Let's do offensive attack. Let's do transitional and mo roll into offensive and, and put that all together. And see what it does and see what works for you. And, how you. and what you need to pull it off. Are there going to be challenges with it? Sure. Absolutely. We're going to do it right the first time every time? Absolutely not. That's unrealistic. The, the, um, in this pursuit of, perf of perfection, excellence is usually lost. I hate to say it. We focus so much on doing everything you know, 100% right that even just being excellent at this is where, where we should be. But it, it requires change. And change, as I said before, Steve, is not something that the fire service embraces a lot. You know? Very true. And you said the motto that – that represents that, which is the two things that firefighters hate the most is change and status quo. Absolutely. Unfortunately. Yeah. And so I think, you know, you've made some key points here in, the, in this, this part about can we, as, a, as the fire service and each individual member of the fire service, can we bring ourselves to the point where we can move away and say our history is important to us because that's what brought us to where we are today. But they things changed for them just like they're changing for us. And they adapted and you know adapt and overcome. That's what it's all about. And we have to learn today and be willing to say, wow, you know, that that old method that we were using eight years ago just doesn't fit today, you know, for what we need. And what can we do about it to make ourselves better and bring ourselves up to date for what we really do need for today's and possibly tomorrow's fire or tomorrow's rescue or whatever else? Oh, I would agree. And, and you know, the, the documents do that. I, I really believe that. NFPA does that. And, and, you know, Steve, you and I have spent probably the better part of 80 years combined putting, putting fires out. I mean, and we have seen some changes. You know, I'm, I'm sure when you started, you probably started like I did. You got a long three-quarter coat, pull-up boots, set of fireball gloves, and a helmet. If you're lucky, you got a hood. Um, and then we we have now morphed into a protective ensemble that people complain about that's too heavy, too bulky. But when you take a look at the alternative and you had the people that said, well, my ears start to burn. I know I'm in too far. I'm never going to wait that long. I mean, you know, I was trained never throw water at smoke. Well, now – right. 
you know, and brother Andy Starnes and I, you know, uh, preach this all the time with thermal imaging. Well, if you're going into a smoke filled environment without a thermal imager today, you're a fool, a fool's errand, you know, and you look at the numbers, line of duty deaths, 78% of the time, the tick is left on a rig. What are you doing? Take the, we're, we're handing you the equipment, you know, and, and, and here's, here's another diatribe that I have, you know, when, when, a, when a, when a fire department buys equipment, we do not embrace technology. We embrace technology, but we don't embrace training very much. Right. We really don't. You know, uh, you think about three things that are sales and this is not a knock on sales. Believe me, it's not, but three things that's, that's the salesmen bring to a firehouse after they buy the new piece of equipment, they bring the piece they bought, they bring the bill and a box of donuts and everybody's happy. It's very rare that that salesman comes out and says, okay, why don't you get everybody together and we'll pick a day or we'll pick a night, we'll pick a weekend day, or we'll go with you <clears throat> and we'll show you how to use this in an environment that it's designed to use. How about that? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, it would be fantastic, you know? Um, but to try to get them t t to the table with this, it's, it's tough. And, and, and it's not, it's really not as new as everybody thinks it is. So for example, um, the minute they hear NFPA, oh, NFPA rules, NFPA rules. All right, let me ask you this. Um, what's, your, what's your turnout gear rated to based on what standard? Oh, we follow NFPA. Okay. So if I walked into your firehouse and said, hey, guys, times are tough. Uh, you know, we're just going to start buying jumpsuits. We're not going to buy NFPA turnout gear. You'd have an uprising. If we said your SCBA, whatever brand you use, are no longer going to be NFPA uh, 1981 compliant. Uh, we're just going to go with the cheaper, the cheaper uh Compliance, you'd probably have, you'd probably have chaos in the apparatus bay. You know, if you said apparatus-wise, uh, we're changing, we're not going to adopt the light package that's approved on NFPA. Uh, the pump doesn't have to be third-party rated. How about that? I mean, you jump up and down. Our service would go crazy. They would go nuts. Now here we are. We're saying, okay, here's the safest way to do this. Here's a document. And you're right. What's they saying? Oh, you want me to change? It's the same sanctioning body that's that keeps you safe in your turnout gear and in and, and the air you breathe and the apparatus you ride why are you arguing about that <laughs> you know in the big picture it really doesn't make any sense yeah. and i asked this question to, to to the officers oh you don't want to follow that okay what do you got what are you basing your policy on and i hear it all the time tradition well tradition. yeah come on i mean there's where's your data data to prove that what you're doing is absolutely the right thing to do the big difference between putting a fire out and burning a fire down to the level that you can you can perform at, you know, and we've seen it. I'm sure yeah. you've seen your share. Of them. I've seen my share of them as well. So it's right. it's going to take it's going to take some change. I'm going to I want to close this segment with a, a a tragic story from my first department in North Carolina. Uh, the life belts had come out, and um, uh, the sales person for the belt came to our station that day. Um, I was I was working, so I didn't see it as it happened. But they want to change the clasp on the belt to the, tie, to the wire. And the ca our captain said, I think this this one works really good. I mean, we've we've pushed, we've pulled, uh, we've used it many different ways, many different heights. It it's great. It, it stands it goes, and I really don't like the look of this other clasp and the salesman said don't worry it's it's much better than what you already have we made that one but we this one's better and so the captain said all right well let's give it a try so they switched it out and our mechanic may rest in peace um went up we put up our our snorkel we had a 75 foot snorkel put him up he climbed up fast put his belt climbed up the rail, went up to the top, and then the salesman wanted him to go freehand, just by the belt. He did, and he fell in front of 13 second graders. I'm sorry. He, he, really he, was, he, was, well, uh, he didn't pass from that, he, but he was seriously injured, broken back, became a paraplegic, um, and uh, life became very, very difficult for him, of course. And uh, subsequently, he, he passed uh, long-term injuries and, and other things. But this is why you need to know. And, and like I said, same thing. I, I, in my 
civilian job. I dealt with lots of salespeople. And you can tell the good from the bad from the mediocre. And this, our captain was not happy with the presentation. He didn't like the design, what he could see from it. And he was, he, he was right from the get-go. He was right from the get-go. So sometimes, whether it's belts, whether it's uh, ropes, whatever it is, a salesperson may go out of their way to try to make that sale, even if it's not exactly 100% accurate. And that, as we learned in our department back then, that can take a terrible, terrible price. Yeah. I'm yeah. very sorry to hear about that. Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break with our guest, Captain Mike Daly. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about KTF, Kill the Flashover. So those of you watching the video, you won't see anything different. Those of you listening to the audio, well, you know how it works. We're going to take a little break. There'll be a few uh, public service announcements. And then we'll be right back with Captain Mike Daly as we continue and talking about Kill the Flashover. So as always, we hope you'll please... Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. Our guest is Captain Mike Daly, and a firefighter with over 37 years of experience on the job. He's also an instructor. He's also a member of KTF, which we're going to be talking about momentarily. Killed a flashover. He's a teacher. He's actually the president. Are you still the president, Cap? Yes, he is still the president of Kill Flashover, along with our our good friend and and close comrade, especially with Five Alarm Task Force Corp, our nonprofit brother Andy Starnes and brother uh, Nick Higgins from the Firehouse Tribune. And to know that Andy, I've known Andy and KTF since I first met him on on uh, social media, and he was one of the people who really took me in welcomed me shared me with other firefighters hooking me up and was one of the ones who said you know this might not be a bad idea if you do a podcast you have a radio background and you know you really know a lot of stuff from your time that you could bring it's important for the discussion well here we are seven years seven years later and uh still doing it so since we've talking about brother andy and brother john and uh, Brother John Haywick was right next door to you also up in that, that same neighborhood. And Nick's Absolutely. right in New Jersey as well. Is Kill the Flashover. So for those who may not know what Kill the Flashover is, let's start with that, please. And then we'll proceed from there. Sure. So um, Kill the Flashover actually started like a lot of great ideas start on a napkin in a bar in a restaurant. Um, <laughs> Chief Joe Starnes, uh, Chief Jay Coy, Chief Sean Oak, Warren, Chief Warren Whitley, and, and if Jim Mast, Chief Jim Maston as well, um, some of the founding fathers that, that put this together said, uh, you know what, we're, we're tired of seeing firefighters that wind up getting injured or, God forbid, killed in a line of duty from thermal insult, when especially a lot of these are avoidable. And, and if you look at NIOSH reports, and if you start to look at the top three causes that are most common, I will tell you that 90% of the time you will see a very poor or limited understanding of fire behavior and how the application is made strategy and tactics. But with that, our, our founding fathers, if you will, started off with this task to educate the fire service and uh, started to bring people in with their message and started to grow uh, exponentially, I would say, to where we have now become a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we have now developed curriculum that now exceeds the fire and emergency service higher education requirements for colleges, uh, FESHI requirements, which now um, can qualify for educational credit towards fire science degrees. Um, we've trained a couple thousand students in the last 12 years. We now have the fall, the fall semester will be coming up starting in September. We're just finishing up 
our spring semester, uh, we use a full online Canvas support LMS system. So now the students literally take their tests, do their reading all electronically. We can, we post midterm grades, we post exams. This is truly done. Uh, what I like to think is we've made Chief Starnes and everybody else proud of where we've taken their idea and moving it forward. I like to think that um, Chief Starnes is still involved with us. Um, Chief Coy still helps us wherever he can. Chief Whitley is, is our educational director at this point. Um, who runs Fire Behavior University. Um, we've developed curriculum through uh, approved uh, FESHI documentation of books. We've, we've downloaded as many free books as we can for the students as well. Um, and the information to me is second to none. And it's based a lot on the science that we're seeing today. So one thing that I think Kill the Flash over does it brings a lot of like-minded people together to say, okay, we agree, this, this has to get better, how can we do it? I have a picture um, that I have um, in my files, it's probably one of my favorite pictures that I have. In, in 2015, I think, was the second or third year I was out at Kill the Flashover, and Chief Davis from Oak Drove uh, Fire Department in Shelby, North Carolina, is a huge advocate of ours. Can't say enough about Chief Davis and the people from Oak Grove Fire Department. One of his engines was was sitting in front of this house we were using, and Chief Starnes had this great idea. He said, I want to get a picture of everybody's helmet. Well, there's a stack of helmets, probably 34 or 38 helmets on the front bumper of Oak Grove Fire Department. And these helmets are from all over the country, all over the world. We had people from all over the world who came in. This year we were just stacked with, with people um, and, and a lot of great support. And it's a picture just, it always reminds me of, listen, you know, we all agree that things have to get better. And there's so many like-minded people in the world that want to make it better. And I'm just blessed that I was in, indoctrinated through Chief Starnes to do this and still be able to provide some positive influence when it comes to Kill the Flash over and the message that comes out. Well, one thing, since you mentioned Chief Starnes, I want to give a shout out to uh, Brother Andy's uh, wife and the team that got Chief Starnes to FDIC. They got him there safe and sound. And I just think they definitely were the angels for that, for that mission uh, that took care of that. I think it was great. I was so happy to see that posting on social media that he was there. Uh, you know, we both love Andy. I mean, it's he's just a, one of those people absolutely dedicated to the fire service and making better and taking care of the people in our communities. That That's his priorities, his, his faith, his family, and being a good firefighter, being a good instructor and teacher and sharing that, like you and like so many, like Brother John Dixon, John Hayowick, and, and, and Nick, all these people I've had the the honor and the privilege to to meet over the years who share my passion for teaching and education that we're never too old to learn and we can never stop teaching what we've learned to others coming up behind us and no matter what profession it's in but for ours the one that we love being firefighters it's incumbent upon us to know that we must pass on our experiences our what we learned to the group coming in behind us because they're already learning stuff that we didn't. And so if we can fill in the background to what they're learning for today, I think that makes for a better fire service all the way around. I would agree. And I think that's a big part of our mission. It's amazing. And, I, and I'm going to quote Chief Joe Starnes. We don't know, but we don't know. Um, and and the amazing thing with this great group of people, um, after you complete uh, the two semesters of uh, Fire Behavior University, you, you get an opportunity to earn what we call your craftsman accreditation, where you have to come up with a hypothesis that you try to prove or disprove and, and determine where that falls into fire behavior and how that works. And I had gone through it as well. I have my craftsman as well. Um, and my hypothesis was about air track and moisture content being drawn into a compartment when the room reaches lean flash over a ceiling and how much air will it pull, airspeed, things like that. 
So right now we have three uh, members that are, uh, are ready to do their craftsman accreditation. Um, and again, a lot of it is based on some of the things that we just don't know. And the nice thing about that is we can all get together and try to figure that out, what we know and what we don't know. So for example, uh, Brother Dixon has a, a great hypothesis that we're going to try to prove or disprove um, vertical ventilation in a compartment fire that reaches flash over. Will that vertical ventilation dynamically switch from a intake for an exhaust and be able to support enough air to keep the fire going? We don't know. We really don't know. We're going to find out. One of the other things that we're, th that we're trying to figure out how we can measure and prove is how we can prove Thornton's rule a hundred years later. Now, for those that are listening who don't know anything about who WM Thornton was in 1917, WM Thornton was a, was a scientist who discovered that the amount of energy that comes off a compartment fire fuel load is constant. The only variable that can change that is the amount of air that comes into the compartment. Now, it in 1970s, it was proven by the NIST when they did their fire flow calculation. So for all of you pump operators out there that swear by the length times width divided by three calculation for water flow, welcome to Thornton's rule. That's where that came from. The big question we had the other day, and it's amazing, we were just sitting at a, on an online Zoom meeting. We were talking about the curriculum we were just finishing up and and we were talking about Thornton's rule about air and I forget who asked the question. They said, Hey, you think Thornton's rule is still accurate with the, with the high energy heat release fuels that we have in the same size compartment. And we all kind of looked at each other and we said, definitely, maybe. So <laughs> now an idea is born. So our, one of our, uh, our next ideas at one of our next burns we're going to do is try to compartmentize and measure uh, a volume of air versus uh, heat output and see if Thornton's rule is still accurate, but his measurement of opening is somewhere around 25% of the overall square footage of the compartment. So if it's a 10 by 10 room, you need 25 square feet of opening. To pull enough air in to get the room to flash open. So the question becomes now with the high energy fuels we're dealing with today, high energy heat release rate fuels need more air. Well, our question really is how much more air and what happens if it doesn't have this? What if it has the same amount of air as before? And the answer definitely maybe. stay tuned. We're going to find out. That's, that's great. It's a great example. I also like watching um, the uh, videos on social media from uh, Andy and, um, and the Max Firebox team because they're able to pro provide great learning in a very small container that has changed, I would say at least three of my concepts that I thought about how fires work and how we apply water and stuff like that. And the first time I saw them, Andy's lesson where they got the fire going in the box and they spray the door of the box. And all of a sudden you have this very easy door to open and an easy way to make uh, start going inside yeah. only because you spray, you sprayed a couple hundred gallons of water on the front door. Well, mm -hmm. we never thought of it before because we thought we had to go through the front door to do right. it. No matter what we, was gonna, we were going to meet on the other side. This was simply in my mind, brilliant. Why hadn't we been thought of, why didn't anybody else think of this before? But today, awesome. exactly. It's the concept of moisture conditioning that nobody thinks about because, and again, Steve, I'll talk about our indoctrination where you can't throw water at smoke. Boy, if somebody changed that thought process 30 years ago, we'd probably be much further ahead. Right. So I think that what Kill the Flashover can do for those of you who are listening, and again, Kill the Flashover doesn't make any difference if you're a career volunteer, WUI, they want students. If you want to be a student, they're willing to teach if you're willing to learn. And that's what you have to remember. And we, we just said it a moment ago, but for Mike and, and me, there is no arguing the fact that as a firefighter, you must continue to learn. 
no matter what tradition you have in your department, and a lot of them are wonderful, heartwarming, who we are as firefighters all apply, but but you also have to learn what's happening today and what may be happening tomorrow. And the only way to, to do so is to be continue to be a student as a firefighter. Maybe it's local, maybe it's a regional meeting, maybe it's a national meeting. Either way, any of those will afford you the opportunity to learn, to get a good grasp of the ideas presented, and make sure you feel comfortable with them. And then when you do, and you hightail it back to your department, then you got to share that with other people because you have to be the teacher at that point. And that's what killed the flashover. The names that Mike has shared with us this morning, these are some of the great names from 25, 30 years ago who made inroads in the fire service of how to keep us safer and how to make the safest but most effective attacks when necessary. And that's what it's about. It's not, I hate to use the old cliche, but it's not rocket science. It's simply no, it, using fire science. And the amazing thing about this, and this is the, the concept that we embrace as well, Steve, we don't lose, we learn. If you, if you come up with a hypothesis and it doesn't pan out the way we want, okay, we still learn something. We don't, we don't say, okay, that was a failure. It wasn't a failure. You know, uh, science is all about being naive at some point where you don't believe certain things in that, or you do believe certain things until they're proven differently. And the reality of it is we don't fail. We just educate better. And, and that's where a lot of the people who participate with us stand on this. I mean, we had, um, we had an opportunity about four years ago to bring uh, the hydrovent uh, applica applicator into one of our burns and uh, the rep came down. We, we did a, we did a compartment fire, used it, did some great things. Is it for every application? No, but we found out, we found some of the things that it works really great for. And it's a very useful tool in the fire service. Does it look like a normal nozzle? No. Does it scare people away? Probably. Does it work? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, fog nails. Uh, where people would would not even think about piercing nozzles anymore. When I, I got on a fire service, the first fire truck I got on in a vocal volunteer department I belonged, we had a piercing nozzle, and I'm like, well, I'm like, what is that thing? Like, I would never use that. And today, now the fog nail is a great tool for 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 uh, difficult compartments to reach. You know, um, reintroduction of the Bresden distributor on how it's flowed and the best place for it and how to use it. In below grade spaces now with a lot of low below grade variable grade structures it's becoming much more prevalent to be that first line of effect how can we use it how can we use it better all of the things that we do we all bring these ideas and we say okay here's what we want to do and here's how, how are we going to measure it what's our benchmarks what's our data points and then we say all right based on this this is what this does okay well then, it, then we know that we didn't lose we learned even if it didn't do exactly what we thought it was going to do well, now we know exactly what it's going to do because we learned what to do. And, and that's, and I think that's where a lot of people in the fire service are sketchy or skeptical. You know, well, what happens if we have to change? Well, okay. Well, what happens if you don't? What happens if you come down and, and uh, you know, you, you witness this and then you go, oh, wow, that really works. All right. Well, now you witnessed it. Well, where's your argument? Here, where's your data? I mean, here's our data that we're proving, you know, and, uh, we share a lot of the information that we prove. We have the video, and I'm sure as you've seen Andy's. Uh, we are reworking our uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, I am not the technology <laughs> person on this squad, believe me. Uh, Chief Fling out of uh, Dix Hills is our technology uh, guru. Um, does a great job keeping our website up. We're working on trying to get some uh, some video spaces for the members to actually be able to look at some of this stuff for, for references. Um, beyond just being in the classroom, uh, we're trying to get our, our YouTube channel back up so we can share some of this data and get it out there. Um, so there's a lot of good things happening. But I think just like we talked about uh, earlier today with, with the, uh, the embracement of change in the fire service on how we would operate, well, we, we, and I'm going to quote Chief Joe Steins again, we don't know what we don't know. And, and we're always learning. 
three plus decades in the fire service and, and I'm still a student of this great profession that I decided to embrace. And, exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's, those are some of the most important words you've said today is that you're 37 plus years in and you're still a student of the craft. You didn't say you're the master. You said, I'm a student of the craft. And you know, what you mentioned before about those nozzles, I remember the first time, not that I need them down here in South Florida, but when I was in North Carolina, first time I saw a cellar nozzle. I didn't have been in the fire service before. I never intended to be a firefighter. It just kind of happened. Life took me down a crazy path. But then we had the first fire that we, the chief said, you, you, cut, you guys cut a hole in the floor and put that nozzle down there and, and you're going to use that. I said, what? That's, gonna, that, that's not going to do jack. I mean, we got to get in there. Now we put it in, we ran it about two minutes, and that basement was done, finished. Wisps of smoke was all that was left. And I said, who the hell invented, knew to invent something like that? And we had a piercing, an old style, the old piercing nozzle as well on our, uh, on our, on our, our uh, snorkel. So, yes, innovations come out, and that's good for any I don't care, any professional field. You need innovations. You need growth to learn more and to be better and do better. But sometimes it's not clear to us when we first see it. Don't We get that, um, we get that blinder look that, um, yeah. well, this tool is only good for that. And, you know, it's funny you segue into the cellar nozzle. You know what we found out? Great on attic fires. <laughs> Great on attic fires. We would have said, hey, what? What if we cut a hole in the roof and threw it in the roof? Maybe. Let's go find out. And what do you know? We're great. There you go. So <laughs> something simple, 50 years old, right? 50 years old piece of equipment. Uh, we sat on the back bumper. Had no idea what we could use it for. Yes, they told me, but I said, what's, what's that going to really do? Come on. You got to be in there with a nozzle, whether it's the fog nozzle, you're going to go smooth, whatever. We got to be in there with it. No, we don't. No, we don't. And it's fast. It's much less dangerous because we're not making entry. It does the job most of the time. And people didn't have to risk themselves to knock it down. That's a good day in the fire service. Again, it's a tool in the toolbox. And as Chief Burns said before, it all depends. Depends what I see when I show up. It's another tool in the toolbox. And that's what... We preach. It's and, and we get this all the time with nozzles and equipment. And I get this all the time. All right, KTF, what's KTF's stand or what's your stand? And I, I'm only going to speak for myself. But what's your stand on nozzles? I get this all the time. What's your stand on nozzles? You're the fire behavior guy. You're the fire behavior guru. What's your stand on nozzle? What's the best nozzle? Here's the best nozzle. The best nozzle is the one that the operator knows how to use the best way. Period. Whether you're... You know, as Andy, Chief uh, Brother Andy says, hey, you're a smoothbore Baptist or a combination Christian. I really don't care. If you can't use that nozzle correctly, it doesn't matter. I can give you a brick. The result's going to be the same. Best nozzle is the one that you know how to use competently. So. That, that's a great way of looking at it. Now, if people want to get in touch with Kill the Flashover, if they're interested and say, hey, can I get some more information? Maybe I want to be a student. How do they reach out? Because we're going to put this in the show notes. Our website is up and running, killtheflashover.com. If you go there, you can navigate to Fire Behavior uh, University. There's a page there on what the class is all about, what the topics are, what curriculum we use. Um, we run the entire curriculum every year. Uh, we're just finishing part two up. The final exam actually is uh, today. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yeah. No, I'm sorry. It's next week. It's the two weeks after Indy. So if you Today we're going to be doing a review, final review for the uh, students. Next Wednesday they'll sit for the uh, for the exam, um, and then we'll be off for the summer. And we're not off. We are actually going to actually have a couple of meetings. Curriculum committee is going to get together and guys say, "Okay, what worked? What didn't work? What do we need to change? Did we find a better resource for this, or did we find better videos for this? Do we need?" And everybody, everybody that sits at at our level, if you will, the, the ones that that are on that committee. We don't say, okay, this is the way it's going to be. No, this is what we do. Here's what we think. We have uh, 
12 or 15 senior members and go, okay, folks, give us an opinion. Here's where the curriculum's at. This is where we need to go. Everybody has everybody that we've uh, indoctrinated in uh, at, at the senior level here has all of the curriculum, has the books, has the, uh, the data that we use and say, okay, well, is this the best way to serve this or, you know, and, and it, it takes a month or two of fine tuning every time we run it because we always see things that work really well. And then we see things, well, you know what? I can understand why the student was a little confused at this point. So let's address that, fix that. And uh, so we'll be, we'll be, we'll be fine tuning again. We'll be ready to go up in the fall. Probably don't quote me on this, but probably mid September, um, probably at, after the third weekend, we'll probably be looking to kick off again. And we'll probably go till the beginning of December uh, with, with the next semester of Fiber Here University. So the, uh, we put out the announcement usually six weeks in advance for anybody that wants to enroll. Um, so if you follow us on social media, we have a Facebook page, Kill the Flash Over. You can check our website regularly. Um, we're up on Twitter as well. I kill the flash over. So we're trying to put out as much information as we can. And all any? our email. Right. I'm sorry. sorry. All our emails are actually linked as well. There's an email link on each site. So if you want, just click that uh, again, our, uh, our technology guru chief fling is always checking emails and kicking them where they need to go. Um, and somebody will get back to you within 24 hours. Yeah. Chief fling is a great guy. He, uh, matter of fact, every podcast we, um, we do uh, face piece on, we do a PSA for Face Be Son that came from Chief Fling. Uh, matter of fact, yep. I reached out to him about six weeks ago and said, I'd love to have you come back, Chief. Um, a great guy. A great guy. Again, a, a walking book of fire knowledge and experience. Absolutely. And people say, well, you know, Dick Sells, that's pretty quiet. But let me tell you something. First time he was here, <laughs> this guy has kicked, has kicked a lot of fire butt in his time, even at when he was chief of the department then. Let me tell you, Dix Hills is a busy, progressive fire department. They sure is. The action. There's a lot of great firefighters up in that section of uh, of that area, and, and Chief Fling is a true consummate professional. Knows what he's talking about. Believe me, he's 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 crawled his share of hallways. So he is a very, 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 very competent, right. competent instructor and firefighter. Another question is: Are there any minimum requirements for somebody to uh, apply for KTF? training no however we would rather you had a couple of years yeah. of experience we would prefer you at least three years of experience if you want to come right out of uh, recruit school and come in you're, you're more than welcome to uh we do require that you finish recruit school within you know once you've done that and you're interested um some of the students have actually come in that have 10 or 15 years some are captain and battalion chief level and they want to start at the second semester because that's just the way it rolls. Uh, and we've allowed that. Um, but for those that are, that are getting their initial indoctrination into something like this, we would recommend uh, going in through part one, uh, which is more of the science base, which is the one that we're actually starting off in September. So we literally just finished part two. Uh, next week will be the final. And then we'll be kicking off part one again in the, in the fall. So that, that's good to our, know. And, uh, uh, so if you are, we're going to put the uh, contact information in the show notes. But if you are interested, all you have to do is go to the website, killtheflashover.com, and you're going to look for the Fire Behavior University uh, tab, and then you can uh, make your, read through, have a good understanding before you send your submission in. Uh, know what you're getting into. Okay, This is not a bunch of guys sitting around the kitchen table, just shooting the bull about, oh, you know, I remember this fire when we did this. And uh, just be careful. Uh, cut your water flow. No, no. This is a fully engrossing educational experience. And yeah. knowing, knowing some of you folks as I do, I can tell you folks that these people are dedicated to you. That's who they're dedicated to, to. Besides taking care of the people and the property and their communities, they are dedicated to each and every firefighter who wants to come through this class to make them a better firefighter. And I've seen better people coming out of it 
as well. You're a better person after it because sometimes you, when you learn more, you actually grow as a person and as a professional rather than just assuming, as we know what that word results in, that you know everything you need to know to do the job. And as the captain said, as every one of our fire guests has said, going all the way back, we were very blessed to have Chief Bruno on in the early days of the podcast. And that was thanks to my good friend, Chief Dennis Rubin, who just got appointed as the interim chief in Kansas City, Kansas. as the fire department there. But he brought Chief, uh, uh, Chief Bruno to the show. And, you know, I worship this man starting in 77 with his first article in Firehouse Magazine. I, he was the guru to me and a couple of my friends were all got in at the same time in this department. And to meet him, uh, I met him once at the uh, one of the early Firehouse Expos uh, in Baltimore in those days when I was there. I met him there, which was a privilege. And he, I just figured a shake of the hand and he'd walk away. No. He said, are you a firefighter? No, I said, no, I was, but I got hurt. And he goes, what happened? Tell me. I mean, he probably stood there five or six minutes. There were hundreds of people wanting to talk to him. And I just went to meet him and say, shake hands. But that kind of told me what I learned from other people a lot later. This is the man who he was. He, you, Every firefighter was important to him. And I was lucky to have our late friend Bobby Halton on the show. And Bobby probably did the longest podcast I ever did, almost almost three hours. But my God, was that man brilliant. And he, he could, oh, cite, page, paragraph of books. This is where you will find this information. Go there, look at, read it, and you will see. He was great that way. Great that no, way. Man, part, he knew everybody. He knew everybody's name. I haven't seen him in seven years. He knew me like that. And to me... When you're that connected into the service like he was, it's just a wealth of knowledge, unfortunately, that, that passed with him. But there was a guy that just, yeah, had the, had the uh, wherewithal to, to make this the service much better Oh yeah, uh, while he was in it. He really did. Bo both those gentlemen really changed the face of the fire service on, on all aspects. They really were. They were great people. Well, Cap, I can't thank you enough for taking time from a very busy schedule, I know, to uh, spend a little bit with us today. As always, great information to share with our viewers and listeners. The NFPA 1700, the new uh, criteria that is absorbing 1710 and 1720. If, you, if you're one of those firefighters that says, well, I'll leave that to the officers and stuff, don't do that. You have an obligation to yourself to your department, and to your community to learn as much as you can. You need to read the 1700. Read it over. Make sure you, you have a good understanding. And when you don't understand something, ask somebody about it. And if there's somebody in your department who doesn't know, post a question on social media. I guarantee there'll be great people, great firefighters, like Captain Daly, like Chief Starnes, Chief Andy Starnes, I mean, who will be willing to say hey let me tell you read this you'll see this little thing and it'll help you understand that aspect of the the criteria that they're addressing and as the captain said today this is a really unique and novel approach that they've taken because in this case they actually include implementation for your department now is it custom tailored just to your department no but it gives you the ideas that you, your department will need to implement 1700 as it comes into the flow of what we have to do in our departments. And remember, remember that these, everything that comes out of the NFPA is for our safety, is for our care, and the care that we share with our communities. Because if we don't, if they don't have faith in us, we don't have a job to do. And you'll get no, uh, what's the right word that's used today, but you'll get no traction 
if you can't produce the right way as a as as a fire department because when you're trying to raise funds you're not going to get them you're trying to generate interest you're not going to get it because you'll have uh whether it's true or not you're going to have a tale out there about your department all we ask is that you strive for one thing be the best firefighter that you can be not like him not like her but for yourself look yourself in the mirror and i love to use this all the time look yourself in the mirror because that person in the mirror knows every secret you have and they're gonna you say to them do i need to study more yeah you do okay i guess i do because that's the honest answer i got back and if guys, oh, no, don't worry, you're, you're, uh, you're all covered. You better change your mirrors. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, we'll have all the information on the show notes, but our sincere appreciation and thanks to Captain Mike Daly for, he's been one of our webinar teachers. He's been on the show a couple of times. We're so happy to have him back again and hopefully get him to another webinar uh, sometime in, in the not-too-distant future. Cap, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. It's always great talking with you. I love to learn with you. And I hope that our, our viewers and our listeners take everything you said today to heart and will make the decision to be one step better each day. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity every time I'm invited, Steve, and I look forward to coming back and doing it again. Good. I'd like to hear that. All right, folks, if you're watching the video, this will be the conclusion of the program. If you're listening to the audio, well, we'll be right back with a little bit more information and uh, articles when we get back. So to all of you watching on the video, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. Stay safe and stay well. And we'll be back. And by the way, I want to let you know that next month we have been able to get Dr. Alberto Caban Martinez back on the show he is heads up the Firefighter Cancer Initiative here in South Florida with the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Centers at the University of Miami Firefighter Cancer Initiative Program. So he'll be back with us uh, next month. And boy, is there have been a lot of changes, a lot of progress since he was last on. So to all of you, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay well, and let's not forget to take care of each other. Bye-bye for now.